Welcome to the Level Up Artist Podcast. We're your hosts, Adriana Ame and Jackie Sanders. We are two art professionals sharing forward the advice and business lessons we have learned along our creative journeys. We talk to artists, leaders, and art professionals to demystify the creative process and discover new ways to succeed as a career-minded artist. If you find value in these conversations, please go ahead and subscribe. This will help other creatives like you find out podcast and you'll be notified when we drop a new episode every Tuesday. On today's episode, we are des- delighted to welcome Rosa Left. Before we dive in, uh, how about a quick introduction? Yes, so Rosa is a paper cutting artist based in Baltimore, Maryland. Each of Rosa's paper cuts is cut by hand from a single sheet of paper using a knife. Her cityscapes are based on photos she's taken in her neighborhood and all over the world. While Rosa is best known for her ability to capture thin tangles of power lines and intricate brick work, she also enjoys experimenting with the novel media such as paper plates and paper towels. She has served on the board of the Guild of the American Paper Cutters and is a member of the Paper Artists Collective. Rosa has exhibited her work throughout the United States and in China. She is a recipient of the 2021 Maryland State Arts Council Independent Artist Award and the 2021 Municipal Art Society of Baltimore City Artist Travel Prize. Rosa delights in bringing a modern urban perspective to a traditional folk medium, and we are so excited to have her on the podcast today. So welcome, Rosa. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me, guys. Welcome. Yes, we're very excited. Um, We first learned of your existence, so to speak. Um, uh, Yourself and another artist also from Maryland um, had an exhibition installed at Artspace, which is where Jackie and I work. And so that was our first exposure. And then on top of that, Artspace did for your exhibition also a special reception the day before First Friday, which was fantastic. And there was like I don't know, like the environment. It was just, it's just so nice. So we it got to meet you guys. Collaboration. I love that show with Kelly Walker. I feel like we're both just like bright and loud and yes. our work just uh, took up a lot of space in there. <laughs> Which is great. And also on top of that, it's like both your works are colorful, but it's not like they competed against each other. They just complemented each other. So it's nice for visitors to be able to see such different mediums yours with paper and her with paint and then just kind of like the conversation that both of your works could have together so that's that's how we got to meet you (laughs) that was great yeah and it's kind of a small world because I'm originally from Baltimore and my cousin is a wonderful artist in Baltimore as well so I love going home and going to exhibitions with him all throughout the city so having two Baltimore artists in my art space studio (laughs) exhibition space was kind of like a full circle it really is a small to more art world around here even (laughs) out of Spain. It's a good town for art. (laughs) It really is and I feel like Raleigh it's kind of a little piece of that extra art world. It's growing in size and it really is a small art world, even from city to city. Um, but I know we described your work a little bit in, in the introduction, but for our listeners, how would you describe your work to someone who's never seen it before? Yeah, I always say it's just holes in paper. And I feel like people who aren't very familiar with paper cutting, like don't realize how serious I am about that, but I am totally a paper purist. Um, so my work starts from original photographs and they're, you know, home, my hometown, uh, where I live now in Baltimore or where I grew up in Philadelphia. Uh, I also travel a lot, got a little mellow there. There was a whole pandemic thing happening, but now we're back to international travel. And, uh, um, yeah, I think I heard something so- about that allegedly <laughs> yeah. a little thing going on. Right. Do you guys remember that? How we got used to the zoom situation? Yeah, vaguely. You know? vaguely. <laughs> Tiger King happened. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I take these photos and I just print them out in black and white, regular office printer. Like I do not have a high tech schmancy set up at all. Um, and I tape them down onto a uh, Canson Me Tents paper or maybe a Tiziano, something that's like lighter than cardstock, but heavier than a regular printer paper. And I'm using these printed grayscale photographs as my stencils. And I just cut through them with a knife that looks like the classic X-Acto knife that most people are used to. Um, I just prefer a different brand of blades. I use Excel. Mm. I cut through the images. And then when I'm done, I tear off my stencil. I cut my signature into my work, which is pretty unique among paper cutters. Um, I just don't like, I feel like the pencil gets messy and I'm like, 
it's just paper just holes in paper (laughs) paper purist I love it yes nice well we got to see it it almost looks like um almost like lace in a way the way Mm -hmm. that the intricate cuts are and how thin you get some of them my brain just goes to like but how that's like string thin smallish I don't know maybe I have like two left hands I don't know but I feel like I would just rip them by mistake or something and yours are just like perfectly laid out and gorgeous I don't know there's just something magical about it yeah yeah probably I have it's funny that you are like lace because all of my work that you've seen and what I'm best known for for sure is these urban landscapes and my like gritty city street scenes and I love my dive bars and bodegas and CD strip clubs and whatever but uh I also have cut lace and I worked with a graphic designer Sveta Ajo and I you know purchased a commercial license from her and I did these huge lace curtains life-size lace curtains uh that are on display right now at the Virginia Museum of Contemporary Art so that's like very exciting super yeah. cool so that's like a whole other dimension of scale in your work I know the, the pieces we've seen were um I don't want to say small scale but I mean under life-size curtain 20 by scale. 30 and yeah. 16 by 20 yeah, yeah. <laughs> regular wall scale um, yeah. but yeah those curtains are like literally curtains that I have on a curtain rod framing a bigger paper cut wow Okay, that is so cool. Okay, we're going to have to see pictures of that later for sure. Um, Well, speaking of paper, so there, and and with the description that Jackie was reading, some of the words that were used, the word craft kept coming up. So a question that comes up for us, especially for artists that are not working in quote unquote traditional mediums, is Mm -hmm. where for you, in your opinion, is the distinction between fine art and craft and how does your work explore the intersection of these creative voices? So I love that you asked that question because I hate that question. <laughs> <laughs> you probably get it all the time. I get, I get it all the time. <laughs> and like anytime you get more than two paper cutters in a room, like there's going to be an hours long debate. It's like, it's a serious problem for us. And so my first initial response is always like, who cares? Does it look cool? Fair. Do you like it? Do you want it in your home? Like, I, I own art that is considered craft probably. And I own art that is definitely fine art. And I just, I'm making what I like and I'm not too worried about how it gets categorized. Um, there is for sure still a stigma associated with craft. And I have applied to galleries, one gallery in Miami that will remain nameless because I'm a classy lady. Uh, <laughs> got back to me and was like, oh, your work is cute. Maybe you should try doing craft fairs. <gasps> and I'm like, not to not craft fairs. I shop at craft fairs, but like, no, my people are not going to spend that price point at a craft fair. That's not what people are looking for at these events. And, you know, I put hours and hours and hours into my pieces. So I think of them as fine art, but I feel like that line is so blurry. And I'm like, can we just throw the whole thing out the window? Who cares? Well, yeah, I agree that perhaps like craft could be like if you're doing something and it's more for a hobby or de-stressor or fun, maybe you're following a tutorial or something and that's as far as you take it. So it's just more of a shallow level as opposed to you can elevate craft to fine art the moment you start putting that intention into it, the discipline that goes behind it. And then the fact that you're aiming for a different kind of market as well. Like, would you agree that maybe those are some of the differentiators? I definitely think intention is a big piece of it. Um, I'm a little bit more hesitant to say that whether you're doing it as a hobby makes any difference, because if you're doing an oil painting as a hobby, does that make it a craft? Like you're still yeah, that's fair. potentially just painting the vase that's in your house and doing something that is more traditional. Um, I think the other primary distinction with craft usually is that it's reproducible. And I would say that my work is not reproducible without some serious changes to my methods. Um, So I could cut the same photograph, you know, make a paper cut based on the same photograph four different times. And each one's going to look different because I'm taking that grayscale and I'm deciding how hard I'm going to make that shadow and just getting it down to these two, you know, black and white or red and pink or whatever colors. Um, And I think if I was trying to reproduce my work, which I don't do, um, just sounds boring to me I don't know Uh, but if I was trying to reproduce my work I would have to you know make the initial paper cut and then I would have to take a photo of that paper cut and use that as my stencil so that the next one came out as close as possible to exact right even I'm sure using the same photograph if you were to 
make paper cuts based on the same photograph at different points, you may select to cut out certain sections versus others, or the line weight might be different in one area versus another. And I think that's a great observation and um, pushback to the question that we asked. So I really appreciate you doing that because I feel like especially as artists, if you have the maybe more traditional academia backing or even knowing of that conversation with art history and what you think the modern world is supposed to be or should be, there's this pressure to, okay, well, which of the textbooks would your artwork fall into? Would yeah. it be in the interior design textbook? Would it be in the architecture textbook? Would it be in the this? Like, and so you're almost like naturally thinking, okay, how would this be categorized by scholars yeah. per se? Because it's the perception that that trickles down into, oh, well, that's not gallery work. That's a craft market work. Um, and I love that perspective of just not even worrying about that conversation per se, and like not feeling like you have to fit into the mold of either one of just standing in that confidence of like, this is what I make. This is the amount of time I spend doing it. And this is my audience that I am reaching through it and just finding confidence in that and not having to worry about making it so complicated of, well, other, someone else will make it we'll see it as this. Therefore, that's what it is. You can be like, no. No matter what you do, somebody's not going to like yeah. it. Somebody's not going to understand it. Like, move along, go to the next gallery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I'm curious with your subject matter. Um, I mean, of course, the craft of paper cutting um, is so distinct, but also you doing urban landscapes. I was wondering if you could share a bit more about that. I mean, what draws you towards those urban landscapes? Yeah, I'm, so I'm just really a city kid. It's pretty much that simple. But I started, when I started paper cutting, I was initially working from uh, illustrations by other artists, looking at like graphic novelists, um, children's book illustrators, and working from etchings and, you know, antique illustrations and seeing if I could turn them into paper cut. And then I think once I mastered a lot of that technique, it was like, okay, what's next? Well, I how do I truly make this my own? And like, how do I come up with these fully original compositions? Because of course, okay, how do I go from scratch now? Um, and I grew up in Philadelphia and I love Baltimore, but when we first moved to Maryland, we were not in Baltimore, we were in the burbs. And I, the best way that I can describe it is that I like wilted and I was like, I can't do this. Like you have to get in a car yes. to drive to everything. And every business is a Panera. Like, I don't understand what's <laughs> happening here. Yep. <laughs> uh, sorry. I'm like, no, it's so business. true. I like more mom than and pop, small business. Like I'm a hardcore locavore wherever you drop me. Yep. So I, I just couldn't handle it. And uh, I got really depressed. And out of that depression, I just started looking back at photos of my hometown and feeling nostalgic. And, you know, like nobody looks at Philadelphia and is like, I just really miss running up to the Rocky statue every day. Like that's not what your experience is if you're a Philadelphian. Right. Um, so the things that I was missing were really, you know, these like cracked sidewalks and crumbling brick factories and the graffiti and the dented cars. And like, that sounds kind of strange, but that's most of your experience if you live in certain neighborhoods in cities. Um, so I was just, you know, looking at these things that felt like home. And then I started giving myself these more complex challenges and seeing if I could figure out how to take that grayscale down to just two colors and turn it into a uh, worthwhile paper cut. I love that. And that is definitely so true. I grew up in Timonium. Mm -hmm. um, so suburbs right outside of Baltimore. Yeah. So yeah, you're so right about like, even the local like unique restaurant is like a chain of 50 and it's just like new yeah. to the area. And I don't think I really recognize that power of um, living in a city and Raleigh, I feel like is a smaller city than Baltimore, but living in Raleigh now, it's like mm -hmm. all of the restaurants you go to are predominantly local and, yeah. um, having that shift in environment really does affect how you relate to your community. Um, and I feel like how you perceive your own identity, how you relate with the world. And so, um, of course, identifying as a city kid, I'm sure that uh, really comes out in your work too, of course, with subject matter, but just that reflective nostalgia of the city. So do you feel like identity plays a big part in your creative process too? 
It does. I, my work is very personal. And I, I think that's probably hard to tell if you're like, yes, this portrait of a pawn shop is clearly Rosa. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's not a whole lot of rhyme or reason to the things that I take photos of and translate into paper mm-hmm. cuts. It's pretty directly like, oh, that's cool. So it is just whatever is appealing to me that is what shares up in the yeah, paper. Uh, but I'm sure inevitably, I feel like as as artists, we all feel as though, oh, well, this might be a complete uh, detachment from me. But inevitably by the story, it's always connected to you. It's whatever you're drawn towards, just as you were describing, which I love, like the crumbling um, sidewalks and what marks on the city street that kind of showcase the community around you, do you feel drawn towards or were missing when you were out in the suburbs of cookie cutter houses and Paneras? (laughs) You're like, I miss the the sign that's half falling down and it's like scraped up from decades of families owning it. Um, just that character being drawn towards it. I feel like it inevitably brings you into that environment that you obviously connect with. Yeah. I, I think a lot of times I don't really understand why I'm making a specific paper cut until I'm almost done with it. And I think that's mm. just like, I spend so much time in my studio with my head down, staring at my table, like very up close and personal with my work. And then I start to like think about what it reminds me of or what things happened in my life that are like, oh, that's why I wanted to cut this really weird tree. Like, (laughs) I remember. (laughs) I feel like that's very true within the painting process too. Um, Especially if you're an abstract artist, you might not have a set plan from the beginning. You're like, I'm generally going in this direction, but by the end of the piece, it becomes this like therapeutic symbolism of this one story or this one idea that just by making the art becomes part of that emotional connection to the end piece amazing I love that um so diving back into the creative process itself how often do you make art I aim for five days a week realistically it's six or seven uh (laughs) I'm trying to do this like work-life balance thing and I am really bad at it. Uh, I am totally a workaholic. Um, Some days are like the really fun days are the days where you get to get in for me to get into the studio at eight o'clock in the morning and I'm there until eight o'clock at night. And like, I stop to walk dogs and maybe eat a sandwich at some point. Um, But of course, any, you know, anybody who is trying to pursue arts professionally knows that you spend a whole lot of time dealing with paperwork and grant applications and just, you know, maintaining relationships with collectors with whoever. Um, So that is more time than I wish it was, which sounds funny because that's also fun, right? Like, it's exciting to be pursuing these new opportunities. But I think that's not why any of us started this. Mm -hmm. Like nobody becomes an artist and is like, I really just want to sit at my computer and be on Gmail all day. (laughs) No, absolutely not. I completely relate to that. But I like to, with that, that does bring me a follow-up question slash assumption. Is your studio at home? It is. Okay. Okay. Um, I am not somebody who wants, it's probably bad for my work-life balance that it's at home, but I love to be able to come and go if I'm busy and stressed, like, doing other things around my house, I'll just stop and go take 15, 20 minutes and just cut some bricks to calm myself down. Uh, mm. I, also food is really important to me. And I just like being able to go down to my like kitchen and make myself whatever I actually want for lunch. <laughs> you don't have to plan out your meals for the full day and pack <laughs> snacks. And that's a whole other, whole other part of having a non-in-your-house studio that isn't really talked about. <laughs> yeah. I did one month at the Torpedo Factory in Alexandria and I was, you know, cutting paper live every day. My work was on display in that gallery space. People were, you know, coming in, having good conversations. And it was like, so fun to have people come and go. And I was like, oh, I'm usually by myself all day. Like there are other people to talk to here. This is cool. Uh, But definitely ended up eating a lot of junk because of it. (laughs) Yeah, I completely understand with that. It's like in my studio, I have to have a mini fridge and a microwave um, and a coffee maker for sure. So that I will avoid that temptation of having to go out to eat somewhere else because it's usually not going to be great. Plus, you know, budget, you know, it's a thing. Um, (laughs) But I like that. We can definitely talk more offline about uh, a few things that even we have to do as well, because even with the studio space, it's very easy to fall into the, oh, look at that. I just worked 65 hours this week. 
wait, mm. what am I doing this job again? Um, <laughs> or I feel overwhelmed. I feel overworked and kind of like trying to strike that balance. But since you Literally mentioned yesterday, my husband was like, you know, you don't have to work yourself to death, right? <laughs> like, I think I do. Though. If you love what you do. <laughs> you know, that saying, if you do what you love, you won't work a day, which is be- BS. Yes. Like, if you love what you do, you can't stop. You won't stop. You don't want to stop. And actually it's much harder. So to find that balance because you just get into the hyper-focus, great, great, great. So, yep, I'm with you on that. But with mentioning having a home studio and then doing the short stint at Torpedo Factory, I do want to ask you, how does your environment and or studio space affect your creative output that way? I've been thinking about this a lot, actually, because I... Uh, have been in my current studio and home since February. Before that, I had a studio that I loved that was super sunny. Like I had a taxi cab yellow wall and I had just all the sort of like memorabilia of past exhibits and things from other artists that I've worked with on the walls. And that felt like such a happy, vibrant space. And then I moved here in February and it's like, it completely is the amount of space that I need. Like it has all of the requirements of a studio for me but I know that I'm moving in January and I've known that the whole time. So I feel like I never settled in fully. Mm-hmm. Uh, That's so fair. It feels more like a place to go get work done. And I love the work that I do, but it doesn't have the same like excitement to it. I don't think. Yeah. It doesn't it feel like, like that creative sanctuary that like you just get energy yeah. by going in. And it is weird. I feel like with any space, whether a studio or a home, it is interesting trying to like temper your expectations of, okay, well, I'm going to be moving in 11 months. So like, why should I bother hanging a shelf there? Cause exactly. like, it's just gonna have to spackle it when I get done, or I don't want to do this because what's the point. <laughs> and that can I definitely affect really your space. Love having people in to come see my studio in the space. I'm like, eh, it's boxes everywhere, <laughs> but the next one will be good. Yeah. Where are you moving to? I'm moving to Puerto Rico. Wait, what? <laughs> the land of my people? The land of my people. It's the land yeah, of your yeah. people too. It is. Oh, we, we never got to talk this my part. Mother, okay. My whole mother's side of the family is Puerto Rican. I still have some family in Cabo Rojo and in Vega <gasps> Baja. So yeah. What? <laughs> I'm from San Juan and Ponce. Oh, nice. Wait, did you grow up in? No, I grew up here. Born okay. in Connecticut, raised in Philly mostly. Accidentally went to Vermont for a little while. Um, but that yeah. happens. We'll Puerto Ricans in Connecticut. I've never heard of that. <laughs> Wink. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's amazing are okay. you staying there to for the foreseeable future or is it a shorter trip the idea is for that to be a permanent move we're giving ourselves like two years to see how we culturally integrate because it is the U.S. but it is not the U.S. It like if that makes any sense it is culturally it is very very different mm-hmm. um just like renting a home that they are asking for like the blood of your firstborn child just Bad. like so much information that I'm like I'm 32 years old I've lived all kinds of places why do you need this uh, <laughs> so there's so adjusting happening <laughs> but, yeah do you yeah, and or your husband speak Spanish, Spanish fluently I speak Spanish yeah uh, okay. my husband understands Spanish but he's a perfectionist so he doesn't like to open his mouth because he's convinced he's going to get it wrong so I have offered him and uh, his brother who's moving with us that they get one month of translation services. And after that, they're on their own. Good luck. <laughs> and they'll be fine. I mean, most Puerto Ricans, they may speak, some may speak with an accent, but they all learn English in school from like pre-kinder. Like yeah. that is a required thing in school. So you guys will be fine. They'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. And it's like yeah. currency is the same. A lot of things are the same. You'll still get Panera. Sorry, since you mentioned it, there's still Panera and Starbucks. And there's everything. also like Pollo Tropical. I, don't know, oh, I love Pollo Tropical. Mm. <laughs> I mean, that one is a chain for the record, but it yeah. is a chain. But yeah. at least it's a chain with fried plantains. Delicious fried plantains. <laughs> But yes, okay, we, we can deep dive on the PR side later, sorry. <laughs> on my mind, it's just like, oh, I want mofongo and I want plantains and I want like- Sorry, I get sidetracked. <laughs> yeah. No, I love it. Because Adriana, when did you move to the US? How old were you again? 2007. Hmm. Okay. So I was born and grew up there, but actually this brings me to an interesting segue, bringing it back to art, actually. Nice. Something you mentioned earlier that just you know, it's just kind of resonating right now. So my work is 
ethnically ambiguous. People don't necessarily know it's from Puerto Rico. I feel the same way about your work too. So it's almost like, it's not like you're choosing to do palm trees, you know, in a sunset cutout or same thing for me. So I do find it interesting. It's like, do you feel like some of those roots are still reflected through the art? Maybe not directly, but indirectly somehow. I don't know. Um, I think some more directly. Uh, I have, I mentioned earlier that I have some work up at the Virginia Museum of Contemporary Art, and that's for an exhibit called More Than Shelter. Um, so they invited artists to just make art about shelter, however you interpreted that. So I was looking at homes in Puerto Rico that were damaged by hurricanes. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the ways that artists have gone in and put up murals uh, or graffiti and just sort of reclaimed these spaces. Um, and the ways that Puerto Ricans have sort of tried to beautify things without appropriate support. <laughs> we won't need to go into a uh, political segue over there, but just, um, so I think that is very direct and that's something that I feel very strongly. And like, when you love an island, you're just like, oh no, this is, sorry, I'm gonna try not to curse. This is screwed up. Like I need to, you know, interpret it in my way and the way that I communicate, the way that I share is through my paper cuts, obviously. Um, so I have been doing a lot of intentional Puerto Rico paper cuts. Nice. Before that, I think it wasn't so much uh, about being Puerto Rican specifically, but, you know, just about where I grew up and showing, you know, Kensington in Philadelphia, which is, has a ton of Puerto Rican, Dominican, Salvadorian immigrants. Um, and whenever I travel, like I get super excited. I've been taking pictures. This is funny of, uh, like Mexican and Chinese businesses all over the world. And like, I got Chinatown in Mexico city and I'm doing like, so these are two new series that I'm working on. <laughs> um, but just sort of like looking at how immigrants take up space in other countries and what that looks like in the most frontward facing way which I think is often food for people yes I think so too I think so too I'm like if you come back down to Raleigh I will tell you exactly where to go for actual Puerto Rican food oh nice yeah authentic stuff but we'll have to talk offline too about some places in PR to go where it's like mm, yeah chef's kiss anyways <laughs> back to food apparently um <laughs> Okay. I told you guys food was really important to me. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Food is a very vital part of the creative process. I feel like it yes. kind of goes under the radar of like, you have to fuel yourself well to have that creative energy going. Yep. You have to tend to yourself physically and mentally and emotionally, which food can be all those things. <laughs> Plus food is also like a tie back to home, regardless mm -hmm. of where you are. It's like, I can be in Thailand and I'll find a place that has like Caribbean food and it just like transport automatically. Like even if it tastes different, you know, it's literally halfway across the world, but I don't know. I feel like there's that comfort that comes with, you know, finding those ties to home. But um, with all that in mind, right? Like the intentions of your work um, and kind of how you're building your career and everything else. Um, what are some of your long-term goals as an artist and how often do you revisit them? Uh, I, I will say that my favorite thing about being an artist, like aside from actually cutting the holes in paper, is the fact that there's always a next goal. Like I'm totally that overachiever workaholic, like you're never done. I mean, you can be if you want to be, but like there's always a new shiny carrot and I'm like, yes, yes. let's go get that grant. Let's go get that exhibition. Uh, and I'm also like pretty relentless about going after what I want. And I, it has worked for me so far. <laughs> Um, so definitely on my horizon in no concrete way, uh, is, you know, I've spent some time in China learning the traditional paper cutting there, uh, with the Baltimore city artist travel prize. I was able to go to Mexico for three weeks and learn traditional papel picado. Nice. I would really love to get in the next couple of years to, uh, either probably Switzerland or Poland to learn about their traditional paper cutting methods. Cause that's the sort of thing that I really know like, from reading from the internet, but I would like to do some of that firsthand experience. Perfect. And is it something that you annually go like, okay, 2023, we're going to Poland, for example, 2024, I want to go to this other country. Is that kind of how you try to map them? It's definitely, I'm having a shift in how I map things as my career grows, because right now I'm, you know, for exhibitions booked through 2024. So it's, um looking at where do I have like two months in my calendar where maybe I can fit something else fun in how far out does that have to be and 
you know, artist is a, a tough business to make money in. So definitely looking at like what programs are available, who can I get to pay for this? <laughs> yep. Um, you, you have to do a lot of planning ahead for sure. Yeah. And that's actually was going to be our next question of how do you seek out those opportunities, whether grants or where to showcase your work, where you sell your work? Um, what does that process look like for you? Um, as far as where I exhibit my work, I really, I mean, I go to a lot of events. I'd like to go to art museums. I like to go to art galleries. So if I find a venue that I think is cool, that's a good fit, um, I just approach them directly. I think uh, a lot of people get caught in the wheel of applying to open calls and just paying these 30, 40, $70 fees all the time. And that adds up like crazy. Yeah. Um, so I really try to, as much as possible, just reach out to people directly and say, Hey, I love your gallery. This is what I do. Uh, when can I come show you some of my work in person? Um, and that has been pretty successful for me overall. It's definitely a numbers game. I get ignored more than I get, you know, <laughs> invited in the door. Um, but that's mostly how I get my exhibition opportunities at this point. And I am mercifully getting to a point where people are approaching me and inviting me to do exhibitions, which helps um, both with the fees and the time and everything else. Uh, there was another part to your question. Um, for seeking out opportunities for showcasing or selling your work. So selling your work also, do you mainly um, exhibit and sell through galleries or um, how else do you sell your work? Through galleries and through Instagram. Yeah. Mm, nice. The power of social media. I know. <laughs> I just freed myself from Facebook recently, but Instagram is still good to me. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, so. Yeah, I feel like that's a ever evolving conversation as artists. And we talk about a lot on the podcast. It's a super empowering time to be an artist because you can have so much control over your voice and the messages you put out and having a website where you share your artist statement. It's not as uh, a, okay, you have to get the approval of a gallery in order to contact someone who may want to buy your work. Um, but that also comes with, as you mentioned earlier, the extra admin tasks and updating your website and applying for exhibitions or reaching out to people on Instagram. Um, it, it's the the pros and cons of it for sure. Yeah. 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 Cause it's different too. It's like, um, there's artists and I was this artist at one point earlier in my career where it was like, I would make the art, but selling it wasn't as important because I had another day job to pay the bills. Uh, yeah. but the moment the art has to pay the bills. Yeah. There has to be an increased focus on some of these admin tasks, but just like, well, the three of us know, you know, you have the events and opportunities and exhibitions and grants and calls. And like you mentioned, if you're approaching directly, you got to do follow-ups trying to yep. stay in contact with collectors and remind them that you're alive and have new work for them. <laughs> um, how do you stay organized? Uh, I have to-do lists everywhere. Uh, I have little thought webs everywhere. In my last studio, they were pinned up all over the wall. I am old school. I use a paper calendar and I will write things in different fonts based on how important they are, what type of thing they are. Uh, I color code with magic markers, like everything has to get written down. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I've heard of color coding, but I haven't heard of different fonts. That's really interesting. Or yeah, web no. thought webs? Is that what? Oh, you yeah. Like if I get. What is that? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's like usually for me, it's how I plan out an exhibition, whether I'm working on a specific exhibition that I know is happening. And it's like, okay, I've got this coming up in March. Let me web out a title or whatever it is. But sometimes it'll just be like, hey, I haven't cut. Uh, any, I don't know, what's a good example, parking meters. So it'll be like literally writing parking meter in the like center of the web in a little bubble. And then off of that, having all my little, I don't know, like, like a spider web, all of my little ways that come out of it. There's probably a real word for this that I learned in like middle school or something. Uh, <laughs> but just, you know, everything that's like associated, it's very like free form, free uh, word association. Like, okay, we're going to do a parking meter. We need some good stickers on the side of it. Like, is it out of order? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. almost like visual indicators of elements that you may want to include in that end image of, I almost think of like a painting series per se. Okay, I want some of this scale. I want some of that scale or the unpacking of the whole concept in that bubble of the range of types of parking meters and what are the parking meters maybe saying or what do you want them to say? And 
That's but then I have this problem where I'll do something like that. And then I'll go outside and like for a week, I won't be able to find any good parking meter. And I'm like, there have to be better parking meters. <laughs> this isn't good enough. Yes. This does not fit my vision. <laughs> you just stand by the parking meter and wait for it to expire. So you can get the picture where it says expired. Exactly. <laughs> You're like, actually, can you hold on? I'm waiting four more minutes. I need this to, <laughs> so I love that. <laughs> and now with that, I mean, you have clearly so many ideas what your new series are going to be working on. And I'm sure once you move to Puerto Rico, the imagery may change more or be influenced by your environment for sure. As we talked about identity and um, where you live being a huge part of the work that you make. Um, but is there something you wish um, that you want to do in your art career that you still haven't yet? Do you have like a big goal that one day you want to get to? Oh, yeah. Whenever I am being overly ambitious and like, it's all right. So I had, was at an opening for another artist, another paper artist. And uh, this man came up to us and he's like, I've never met a paper cutter before. Now there are two of you. And he asked me, he's like, what's your long-term biggest career goal? And I just automatically was like, I want to be in the Met. And he kind of laughed at me. And like, some people have interpreted that story as him being rude. And I think he wasn't, I think he was just surprised because I think people aren't willing to like admit that they have these lofty, ambitious goals, but I definitely approach things from a like, well, it's gotta be somebody's art on the wall. Why not mine? Yep. Right. Like start from there and then figure out how to make it happen. Looking at the artists, the contemporary artists who are there, what were their trajectories? What were they doing to lead up to that? Um, So I'm definitely like a goal and work backwards person. uh, So I want to be in the Met. I would very much love for some PhD students to be up late at night cursing my name because they're working on a thesis about my work. Uh, that would be phenomenal for me. I love like, that as a goal. That's a great, <laughs> like, I want to call sleepless nights because they are in search of the original yeah, photograph I mean, that this paper cut, maybe you should just like destroy the original photograph <laughs> just to like, for a few pieces. So they'll be tired exactly. looking, looking for it. <laughs> I want them to- pulling out their hair, like, damn it, Rosa, why didn't you keep better records? Where's your time? Like, <laughs> Where's that paper funny. calendar from circa 2021? Yeah. yeah, that's- You need to know the timeline of this exhibition. It's not documented anywhere. But yeah. I think it's really, like, I mean, I'm being a little bit silly about it, but I think it's wanting to be part of the canon and knowing that like mm-hmm. what I do is often considered craft, it's folk art. And there's not a lot of people who are, Black and Puerto Rican that are doing graffiti in this medium, or they're doing, you know, um, a CD corner store in this medium. So I do think that I'm bringing a new voice to paper cutting, and also paper cutting has just really fallen off in per- in popularity, unfortunately. Um, and I do think it's kind of having a little bit of a renaissance, and I hope that that gears up and that more people get into it. Like I love teaching workshops because people come out and they have fun with it, and they're like it never occurred to me that I could do this. (laughs) Now you're hooked. Like tell all your friends, go cut holes in paper. (laughs) (laughs) And not just at Christmas when you're making snowflakes. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Snowflakes are good too. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. They're good too. Or papel picado for day of the dead. You know, that's another version too, but it's like, yeah, there's, there's other times you can do it any time of the year and it doesn't have to be just for that specific event. It can be to represent other things just like you're doing where you're like there's an image that is impactful to you and you want to express it in a different way which in your case you do it through paper cutting but um with that as we come towards the end one of the questions we do like to ask all of our guests is how do you define success as an artist besides the met <laughs> it's like getting into a big museum um, i think honestly like because there's always another win to be had in art, it's hard to define success. Also defining success as an artist for me looks very different than what is successful to any other artist. You know, like I know artists who are very happy that teaching is their primary art form, that that's what they love to do or um, artists who are more focused on commercial type of work. Um, So I guess the, for me answer, success is pretty much what's happening right now. Like, I love that I get to actually just make art every day. And if I get to keep making art every day, then the other successes will come. Um, but I mean, I feel like I'm living the dream. Life is good. <laughs> yes. Sounds like you are too. And we're so excited to be able to 
follow along with your journey even when you're in Puerto Rico um, <laughs> and see what amazing things are ahead because I'm sure they are. Um, but thinking back to when you first started your creative journey, um, what is one piece of advice you wish you had heard um, before you got started on your creative journey? Uh, I'm gonna go with be willing to say no. I am really good at over committing myself. And, uh, you know, like we talked about being a workaholic and you want all of the things to come. And there's always this fear that like, if I don't do this, there won't be a next opportunity. Or especially if you are actually trying to pay your bills with art, it's really hard to say no to commissions, but just if you don't do the things that don't align with, align with your vision, that don't align with your goals, then that leaves that space for things that do help you get where you want to be. Um, and I definitely like learned that lesson the hard way. Um, not because I was doing things that I didn't want to do, but I just signed myself up for too much, uh, for this fall. And I had a completely unrelated, but family emergency. And it was like one of those drop everything, get on a plane situations. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wait a minute, but how do I keep all the balls in the air while also dealing with like real life, unavoidable stuff, mm -hmm. so, uh, saying no to more things, trying to be better with my schedule. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. I absolutely love that. There's something um, we've covered in the podcast in the past that aligns with that very well, actually. And it's this concept of having or creating your own compass of like, say, your two to three big things you want to focus on in your art career. And anything else that doesn't align, you either say no, or you say, okay, this is a detour that doesn't lead me to the mountain where my big goals are but it might teach me something along the way. And that way I'm not wondering, did, would this have worked or not? Like, let's say some of the big goals that you have mentioned and somebody says, can you teach summer camp for kids? And you're like, mm. but then depending on the opportunity, you might be like, actually it's teaching summer camps at kids at the Met. Well, actually, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like yeah. finding how a line is it. And if it isn't, then just saying like, I'd love to, but no. Um, yeah. So I, yeah, I really love that. Yeah, I love that. I absolutely love that. But anyways, uh, one of the other questions we like to ask everybody is if you had $100 handed to you, what would you splurge it on or invest it in? It has to be something that brings you joy and relates to your art or business. Yeah, uh, I have bought about a thousand different tripods and flexible lighty situations and all kinds of nonsense. And I still have not found one that I like. So I don't know if it would bring me joy, but it would probably be the next one in that line. Um, like, I think I would love to be able to share more process videos of my work on my social media. I think that that's something that people would be really interested in. And also like my work just takes a long time. And I feel like there's this constant pressure to be putting out new content and sharing things with your collectors, with your followers. So that would be a great way to just have more of the in-between like, okay, this isn't going to be done for another three years, but here's what happened today. Uh, so yeah, some sort of overhead light, uh, camera situation. <laughs> yeah. I think that's awesome. <laughs> We've definitely both tried out several ourselves. Um, so we may have some that we can send you links with, but definitely know that struggle of you try one and the marketing says like, this is be the answer to all your prayers. And you're like, yes. well, fix is this problem, but now I need another one to do this. And Exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, how many of these do I buy before I just give up? And uh, right. <laughs> Man. Well, speaking of sharing content online, um, where can our listeners stay connected to you after this episode? And what upcoming opportunities are you looking forward to that we can be along the ride to see? Yeah, man. You can uh, visit my website, rosaleff.com. That's L-E-F-F. -F. And um, there's also the option to subscribe to, a, I call it almost monthly newsletter because I'm bad at sending out newsletters. So it will not be more than once a month. Um, and then also my Instagram is rosaleff. Upcoming, I have a solo exhibit opening at Pyramid Atlantic on December 16th. And that's in Hyattsville, Maryland. Uh, my work in More Than Shelter at the Virginia Museum of Contemporary Art is up through February 5th. Uh, I have work at the American Visionary Art Museum. They have 14 of my pieces on the first floor and some upstairs. And that is up through September 3rd of 2023. So you have a lot of time to check that one out. Plan your road trips, people. Uh, <laughs> I have work in Mask at the International Museum of Folk Art in Santa Fe. That's up through January 15th. And uh, looking forward to a nice big solo show at Philly's Magic Gardens in March. Nice. 
and all of the stuff it's on your website listed out so folks can see yes it's all on my website or for some of the upcoming things will be you know posted to the website as they get a little bit closer Awesome. And we'll definitely be sure to link those in the show notes as well. I will definitely be checking out that Maryland exhibition when I'm up there at the end of December. So I'm excited to see more of your work in person. (laughs) Well, Rosa, this has been a delightful conversation. So again, we are so, so glad that you said yes to coming on to the episode with us and sharing all this wonderful information, the background, the identity bit, the Puerto Rico bit. Hello. Um, (laughs) I mean, this has just been delightful it's been fun thank you so much for coming and joining us on the podcast today absolutely thank you for letting me distract you guys and get you off track (laughs) always always we love to have it as always all the links for what we talked about today including upcoming exhibitions of rosa will be linked in today's episode notes as well as links to all of our other podcast episodes If you want to stay connected with Jackie or myself in between episodes and give us feedback about the episode, what were your favorite bits, um, you can follow us on social media, MetaMate Art, across all platforms. And I'm at J Sanders Studio on all platforms. Or if you want to stay connected with the podcast, we are at Level Up Artists on Instagram. Thank you so much for listening. We'll talk to you next week.